So, Japanese replays. Uh, Brendan S. on the Dungeons and Dragons group asked about uh, Japanese replays. Uh, it's been forever in the making. I've been trying to blog about this on and off. I've talked about them before in other places, but uh, um, I've had a couple of blog posts in my head and, and even light videos or, or podcasts. Uh, but they're ways off, so uh, and some of my plans got canceled, so I'm just going to go ahead and spit a little bit about what I was going to talk about anyway. Um, anyway, the question here was, uh, how do Western actual play reports differ from Japanese replays? Um, oddly enough, I'm one of the most qualified people on the planet to talk about this, uh, uh, not to brag, but... Uh, I'm kind of into the Japanese RPG scene, and I have been for many years. I've talked about this on before. I've had published works on replays, uh, both on the pedagogy of how re uh, of how uh, replays function and how they've worked as knowledge transfer in the Japanese kind of small and insular RPG community. Uh, and I've also got a couple of essays sitting on my head as to how they've really changed the game uh, and created top sellers and even a revolution in Japan. Uh, and hopefully, uh, we'll start seeing them. Uh, in other countries. Anyway, uh, this might get long, so feel free to go audio only if you want. Uh, anyway, so uh, what are they? How are they different? Well, for the most part, uh, Western actual plays are someone writing up like a session note uh, in in terms of like um, what what happened, what was done, uh, like in a story type of format. Uh, th th this character did that. Um, then they went here. Then the party did that. Uh, sometimes, you know, I've seen actual replay for, or excuse me, uh, uh, actual play forms. Uh, some people get very poetic and tell it like a story. Other people uh, just do a blow by blow. The character did this. Then there was a fight. Then this happened, etc. Um, so how they're different from Japanese replays? So replays are basically uh, very simple. And I've got, and the reason I'm doing those in the video is because I got a couple to show. Um, is that they are basically a transcript of an entire session, not just the little snippet that appears in a rulebook section to like show you a, a sample dialogue of how people might sort through a rule. Uh, you know, GM, roll a 20. Oh, I whiffed. Oh, you failed. Uh, no, it's like start from start to like people sitting in the chairs, opening the books and talking about like, hey, what's up? To making their characters, to starting the session, to ending the session, everything in between, including side chatter, um, almost completely unedited. Now, I'm sure they take out a few dick jokes and stuff like that or, or whatever, uh, but you'll find that most popular replays have a lot of side chatter. And it's not a lot. Uh, enough side chatter that makes it real. Like, um, it's not, it's, it hasn't been carefully edited to a degree so that, um, uh, you know, only the story aspects come out and everyone looks really cool. Uh, no, in fact, uh, it's it's more of a humbling thing where uh, some side chatter is included to kind of throw off the fact that like, no, this is an actual real session. Um, replays are long, they're grueling to transcribe, um, but the thing is they're not, they're, they're, they're definitely not fake. Someone doesn't sit down and, and write, um, you know, like pages of dialogue and pretending to be other people. This is actually like a session is done, Someone takes a recorded session, uh, records it, and then transcribes it by hand, um, and then usually accompanies it with illustrations and stuff like that. So uh, they came about in the mid-late 80s, um, around the time of Dungeons and & Dragons and stuff like that. Uh, I don't know the origins. I should find that out later. But basically, the, um, the, or the, the true origin was, uh, or at least I don't, you know, I don't know the date origin but, or, or what game it was, uh, but the idea behind them was, let's introduce people to what these games are, because it's really hard to understand. Now, in the U.S., we had generations of, like, kids being pulled into the hobby from their friends or their older brother or sister. Uh, so they had someone to instruct them how to play it, because they learned from someone else, because they learned from someone else, and they learned from someone else who learned from Gary Gygax, right? Um, and that's how it sort of spread that way. Well, in Japan, uh, only a few universities in Tokyo got them in the, in the mid-'80s. Uh, had access to RPGs, you know, uh, the, there was a bit of a translation lag uh, and things like that. So on top of everything else, um, you know, RPGs didn't come out until like the mid, early mid 80s, uh, right around the time Famicom was coming out. So that's why uh, two RPGs aren't as big as they are in Japan, because right at the time they're being translated and released, uh, Nintendo was coming out and all of a sudden the attention just went that way uh, and, and stayed that way for, for you know, generations. Um, but uh, someone said, you know, 
here's what they, they had to describe what an RPG was, but it was hard to without showing what it looked like. So basically, without video, they they just took a session and transcribed it. You know, this person said this, this person did this, and the format is basically a screenplay. It looks like a screenplay when you look at it, uh, and then that format became very popularized um, for many reasons. One, uh, it's fun; to, they're they're interesting to read. Um, Early ones, not so much. Early ones just gave you kind of a blueprint for what an RPG is and how you interact and what a GM does. Um, after that, after they started settling a couple years, in the mid-90s, people started realizing a few things. One, um, uh, you can uh, become a little bit celebritized by them. In other words, um, you can use them as a promotional thing to, to, to uh, promote your game. Uh, so, for example, some companies would release... Uh, like in the 90s in the US, uh, you know, an RPG core book would come out and then a supplement would come out within like a week just to show you we're, we're going to start releasing crap for this line. In Japan, it was different. Uh, no supplements, but what they did was, or, or supplements later, but they released a core book and then within, usually right at the same time, like the release date would have a replay alongside it to teach you how to play the game, or at least to show you a blueprint of what the game looked like and where it was different and stuff like that. And the thing is, the replay, like later on, would have things like they would be run, or at least uh, one of the players would be the designer of the game. Uh, one of the other players might be a famous designer of another game that was popular. Or uh, uh, in more modern days, things like a popular voice actress, or uh, Obodo Gen, a famous animator. Uh, you get So you get kind of like famous or popular people into these things and uh, people's interests are piqued. And so they, they read them. So, uh, and then people realize as they, they read them, uh, if, you, if you read a couple, you can get the kind of quirks of this player or the quirks of that player. And to see them come out in the next uh, replay that they appear in is kind of a little fun sort of side hobby. Um, and another thing that's cool about this hobby is uh, it created a, ho a sub hobby in Japan that didn't exist in the US. And uh, apologies, I'm, I'm saying U.S., that's where I'm from, but, but I'm using like the Occident, right? U.K. is, is not going to be much different. Germany, I don't think it's going to be much different either. Uh, Canada, of course. So um, it created a cool side hobby, which is uh, that in any RPG group, you have the GM, who's usually organizing and getting everyone together and running the sessions. you got the players, and then usually within the players, you have like an artist. Um, someone who draws like character sketches or something like that. And maybe together you can have, like you can put together a little booklet or something that, for, for your group. Um, in Japan, people did the same thing, but uh, there's also this side hobby of replays where, I'm sorry, this is kind of a tangent to the history, but um, where someone who didn't necessarily have art skills and wasn't the GM, uh, but could grind, uh, could show up, for example, and show up with a recorder, get everyone's permission, record the session, um, the illustrator would uh, supply illustrations. Uh, everyone else would, you know, try to make sure they present a, their, bring their A game to that session. The transcriber transcribes it up, uh, edits it up. The, they get one of their buddies to lay it out, and now they have a, you know, 100 to 300 yen sellable product uh, that is a product of their game group and a product of their love. Um, they're not a game designer. They're not a GM. They're not an illustrator. They're not a layout person but still they were able to contribute to their hobby and produce something uh, that other people liked. And that's, that's kind of cool. Anyway, uh, to go back to replays. So um, recently replays aren't as big as they were. Just uh, the publishing, uh, publishing's kind of dried up a little bit. Uh, some of them are going online. Uh, a lot of them are going to video, which I'll talk about in a bit. But probably the biggest heyday of them was in between like the mid nineties to uh, the late 2000s. Um, where game lines would have replays and those replays would sell sometimes even more copies than the actual game book itself. Um, a lot of people got into the hobby because of that. Uh, they didn't go to the few Tokyo universities where, you know, clubs had a D, like there was, there, there was no D&D &D club, but usually if you look around for a, a fantasy appreciation society or a, a science fiction appreciation society or a Genshiken, um, you'll find, you know, you'll find that half the members are playing RPGs on the weekends. Uh, if you weren't part of that group and you didn't have a brother or sister that played them because they didn't go to one of those colleges, well, you, there was no chance, you, you know, you're, there's like a less than 0 0.001 chance you'd even encounter a, uh, an RPG. They, they don't appear in many bookstores. But uh, replays did. Replays sometimes end up in bookstores by accident or in libraries by accident. Uh, the thrift bookstores all the time. 
uh, there are many RPG designers today, people in the industry, including the designer of the Sword World 2.0, the, the like basically the biggest uh, 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 fantasy game in, in Japan, um, got introduced to RPGs because they they saw a cover of some looking fantasy book and they like kind of like fantasy. They liked it, had no idea what a replay was or what an RPG was, picked it up, read it, thought this is awesome, and then they went out and sought out what an RPG was so they can buy it and and uh, recreate that experience themselves. Uh, I know no fewer than like three people who are like uh, leaders of the RPG industry in Japan as, as how as big as it is, um, who got into RPGs that way. So they're, they're pretty big. Um, and, 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 and in terms of their influence and how much they are a gateway, uh, not in terms of their sellability, um, that, that was always up and down and it's not really as important as the fact that they were a gateway. And I'll talk about that later when I talk about the video part. So replays, um, I've got a couple here, so I'll show you. Uh, what do they look like? So they come in all different size, uh, sizes, but here's the standard one. The standard is called Bungo size. Um, here's my hand for reference. So you can see uh, this is basically the size of a Japanese paperback. This pr particular replay is for the double cross RPG. It is translated in English, um, uh, but basically uh, it follows the bog standard format of replays. Uh, sellable replays, which is it's got a cool theme. Um, one the the designer of the game takes part in it as a care as one of the uh, characters. Um, I'm going to flip through it. I'm not sure how this is going to work out here, but uh, they start off with a few color pictures to show some of the uh, characters and um, you know things that will be appearing there. Usually, kind of poetic description of of uh, the action here. Uh, and this one, it, this one in particular is basically it, it, Double Cross is, is, a, is a superhero game, and this person took it and used it to uh, create Sengoku uh, Warring States era superheroes uh, that fight the evil Oda Nobunaga, who's like this super warrior. Um, and basically, extreme Japanese history. Uh, and then the rest of it follows, like, you know, everyone sits down to the table, they have a couple pages of, of, of exp you know, explanatory text, what is a replay, things like that. Uh, who are the who are the characters that are introduced, and then from this point on, so here you can see that it is uh, you know it's Japanese, so it's moon speak. You're not going to be able to read it, but it, you know it reads um, top to bottom this way. Um, the uh, you can see here that well these are the people's names. These are the actual people's real well not real names. They're their pen names or whatever. Their their names. Their player names. And GM, of course, is the GM who earlier it says, okay, this person is the GM. Um, and uh, they, they sit down, they're talking, they're chatting about the what they're going to play, about the characters they thought up, and then they start pulling out their characters and um, uh, then you know, so, so it goes on for a few pages. Then the characters are made, usually, or, or at least, uh, you know, if they made them themselves and brought them to the session, they introduce them to everyone else. Then then comes a little character sketch of each of each character. Um, it's also kind of a, uh, a trope of this uh, uh, form. Uh, then from that point on, as soon as the character name is introduced, the person's name would flip to the character's name. So if my character's name is Fury, uh, up until that point, I would be like, Andy says this, Andy says this, Andy says this, and then from this point, it's like, I'll introduce my character Fury. And then from that point on, my name will switch to Fury, and all my lines, in character or out of character, will be highlighted by the word, you know, by by my character name Fury. So that's an important thing, is because there there is going to be some out of character talk or uh, laughs, uh, like over here. This uh, character here, I uh, don't know if this is high def enough, but basically it's a it's a kakawarai, it's a it's a lol, l o l. Um, so lols appear or like sighs or us or things like that. Um, and they do specify, you know, when when the GM is talking to the uh, uh, you know characters in general, and then if they're actually, um, sorry, I'm inched, inched, what's that in English? Um, uh, if they're actually playing the the character, uh, like for example here, we see the, the underneath the GM this little mark here that basically is like a quotation mark. So if it's like quotation marks. Um, that means that they're talking in character, things like that. And then the players don't actually, for the players themselves, um, all the rest of the players never have the quotation marks. Whether they say it in character, whether they say it as the uh, you know, in character or out of character, um, it's easy to understand. So, so it's just uh, uh, you know, 
and and also there's there is that sort of gray zone in between, right? Uh, when you throw off a comment, and the GM looks at you, and you're like, oh, th that was in character. So yeah, so they, they don't usually use uh, quotation marks when uh, character speak. Only the GM when they're talking as one of the uh, G, uh, you know, background characters. So then it goes on and on and on and on and on, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then sometimes, uh, again, in, po in the popularized form, there's little illustrations that appear in the middle, kind of like um, light novels that show like, you know, a scene that happens and then there's a little picture of, of the scene. This one's <laughs> interesting. Um, uh, yeah, so that's basically, and then at the end they, they have the epilogue and everyone sits down and then talks about like what they thought and things like that. So, uh, so it doesn't just end, people share their last thoughts. And then usually at the very end after that there's an appendix where um, the, uh, the, the the GM and, their, and the characters give their last thoughts. Or if there was any special rules introduced uh, that they used for the session, they would introduce those, things like that. So that was for um, Double Cross. Uh, Sword World has a freaking ton of them. This is just one of them. Um, uh, yeah, this is done by one of my friends. He's like a half American, um, named uh, Beth. He's a huge dude. Um, uh, very, very cute and interesting. Uh, Ryutama, so like Ryutama's more indie, but they also had, uh, it was sort of like a expectation that they would do replay, so they did them as well. Um, let's see. Okay, so they don't have to be in this format, this Bunko format, but it's just a format that they normally come in. These are, again, this is the size of a traditional um, Japanese novel. In fact, now that I think about it, uh, here we go, just to show you. There are other, uh, <laughs> here's my here's my copy of the first volume of Dune uh, in Japanese, in Moonspeak. It's really, uh, this is kind of warping my brain to, to read it in, in Japanese, but it's fun. Um, but there's, it's, they redid a new recently translation, uh, but instead of recently releasing in a bigger format, they released in a traditional novella size. However, um, Japanese novels are smaller than Western novels. So this is like part, you know, if you've seen Dune, this is this book here, it looks thick and all, but this is just part one. Uh, and there's like uh, three books in this set. Uh, the old translation is five books. Uh, the newer translation the translation is a little bit better. Um, okay, so how are things changing now? The interesting thing about replays is that um, they're somewhat being sold. Uh, people, uh, these new things called video replays have, have taken uh, root and they're cool and they're bringing a new generation of gamers into the field. Um, the old print replays are not selling as much as they used to. However, their use as an instrument of teaching the game quickly uh, and succinctly and to give you a blueprint of not only what an RPG is, but what this RPG is, uh, what makes it fun, and uh, just what, what a session looks like, what, what a good session looks like. Because uh, of course, if you're being recorded, you're gonna bring your A game a little, right? Uh, and these guys do too. And, um, and sure, maybe the, the wording is a little bit cleaned up, but you can tell when you read them, these are people sitting down to play. No one, no one just uh, rewrote all their lines or something like that. Maybe, maybe they touched up one or two things to make it a little bit cooler than it was or something like that, but it's not like they uh, went through entire text and, and, and um, you know, uh, some dramatic speech and then just said like, I, uh, I, I'll do a dramatic speech here. We'll, we'll, just, we'll think about how we're gonna write it later. No, none of that. It's, they, they take a real session because again, the, the main thing is, to use them to teach people how to play or how to play this particular game. The cool recent development, and this is only a few years ago, uh, started with a. Um, it started with other game, but it was popularized by uh, Boken, a company called Adventure Planning Services, uh, mostly through the game Shinobi Gami. Shinobi Gami was the second in this series of games that followed this format, which I'll introduce in a moment. Um, there's about seven in the game uh, series now. Uh, Shinobi Gami is the second, but it's the biggest selling one is also, in my opinion, the tightest of that series. Um, but they did something interesting. So here's the Japanese version of Shinobi Gami. By the way, it's a little bit bigger than the than a Bunko-sized book. Um, it did, some, and for a while, Shinobi Gami was a bestseller. And the cool thing about it is this, I'm sorry, and this, what I held up here, this one's called Insane. It's, a, it's like a one-shot Call of Cthulhu style game similar roles to Shinobi Yami. Uh, the, the, the system, sort of the, the back-end system of Shinobi Yami is kind of like the uh, Apocalypse world, uh, powered by the Apocalypse in Japan. 
a lot of people are using it to do or using it or things similar to it to develop uh, new games. Uh, basically, it focuses on one shots, um, a one book format factor, a replay and rules format factor, and something where the person who buys it and intends to be the GM can buy it in the afternoon, read it on the train home, and then be ready to play that evening. Um, it's that succinct and uh, the, the thing is written in a way that will propel you into a session that quickly. Uh, which, which again, like like a million different uh, developments went on in this in this era, but one of the coolest parts of Shinobi Gami uh, is this: the fact that uh, you can see on the spine there's a white section and a black section, the, or at least a the you know a, a, bl a, a black bleed section. So it it, it, re it goes like this. It reads like this. Um, if I'm actually forgetting now what a Western book. Re oh, it's it's opposite of the Western book, um, and the white part is the replay and the black part is the rules in other words you go through the replay first and the replay uh it's a, it is a full session from start to end and character generation everything uh if you're fluent in japanese you can read it in about it takes about an hour less than that and then after that come the rules did you like the first half of that did you enjoy it well, here's how you do exactly what we did. Um, written succinctly, uh, aimed to get you up and playing. Uh, but the, the incredible thing about this format is that the replay and the rules are combined into one. Um, the rules by themselves are simple. Uh, they could have just thrown them out there and said, we'll, we'll release the rules as like a you know a $5 book and then, then, the, then the replace them with a $5 book. Uh, but they didn't, and that was very important because this was a new type of game. Um, the, the game like this didn't exist before. Uh, the so the nuances of how it plays really needed to come out in a replay and having it on the side. It, it, it people may have just been encouraged to plow through the rules and, and run it without understanding what it looks like. Um, same thing for Insane, the horror game. You can see white section, black section. So this was a format popularized by Shinobi Gami and every supplement as well, every supplement that had new contents and data was prefaced with a replay, a full replay that introduced those elements and then showed you the bonus rules or whatever. We're talking like every book in the series had several, had at least a few supplements. Uh, Shinobi Gami had several, uh, Insane has a few. Uh, each one of those, uh, replay in front, rules in the back. And that format was so popularized that uh, other games by other companies just uh, started using it. Like it, it became such a, a, a not a meme, but a, 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 a recognized way to teach a, a quick game that um, people just just adopted it like it was nothing. Uh, and in fact, even using some of the very unique nuances uh, that this company did. Here's another one, uh, another game by the same company called Amadeus. Amadeus is like a very anime, uh, chunibyo, like a uh, very uh, aimed at the young sort of. Um, I guess the the equivalent would be Scion in the U.S. Like uh, you are humans and gods, but you are so you like these people are like I am Tor, I am you know uh, uh, Isis and things like that, um, and you have like anime like powers and stuff like that and fight. Uh, there's a short replay in front. And all the all the rules and, and a lot of illustrations in the back. In fact, the rule section looks like a, a traditional Japanese RPG, with lots of character illustrations and and, and guidance and stuff like that. And, it, and uh, unlike the other games I was showing, uh, this has a more traditional format. And yet, they had the replay in front to show you uh, the combat system. It's a little weird. It used a lot of chaining combos and things like that. So it was a good it was a good move. And other games by other companies too. This one's a called Deadline Heroes. It, it is uh, popular. It's um. Uh, Kadokawa's, uh, now that superheroes are becoming popular, they said, hey, let's make an American-style superhero game. Um, so they have like a Wolverine clone and an Iron Man and an Iron Man clone uh, fighting crazy wolf head guy. And, uh, and yeah, anyway, uh, it's a very cute game, very light. But again, same thing. Um, the beginning has a full replay rolls me back. Uh, I don't just want to keep doing that over and over again, but uh, I've got a bunch of RPGs here. They're all sharing this format. The, by the way, this format is a little bit bigger than the other format I showed, but um, the books go as big as you know B5, A4. Um, 
it's just that the, the ones that don't have as much rules are now seeing the benefit, especially if they if the rules are strange or the gameplay is a little bit different, of introducing it by um, having a replay in front. And of course, it, it is another opportunity to, um, I guess, uh, celebratize the uh, designer. You know, the designer takes part in it. Oh, well, so we got that famous illustrator. He's playing a character in here too. Um, that sort of thing. You can get that sort of... Um, uh, what do you got? Um, what do you got here? Uh, a rise of of, of uh, people wanting to to uh, jump in and play, um, and it's great too. In fact, like I've got a few RPGs uh, in my collection that I think really could have benefited uh, by something like an like a replay because they tend to have weird or new mechanics, uh, and they um, having a full replay would have been awesome. Uh, to introduce to it because otherwise some of these games are just in, in, in such a, a new format that you have to sit down at a table you ha uh, and have someone teach it to you. In fact, I, I'm a really I guess, poor learner by just reading alone. I usually have to have like uh, a lot of visual input or, or actually be shown to play it. I'll actually hold off uh, on reading rules if I know that I have an opportunity to play with someone who knows it. Um, but replays though is kind of like getting that experience by reading, like I can see, I can see the intricacies of what's going on. And I'm sorry, one more thing. That's uh, speaking of that. Uh, so Shinobi Gami did this as well, and this has also become popularized as well. So the difference that another difference that Shinobi Gami, um, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to harp on this particular game because um, I did the translation of it in English, but uh, but it is the one that was the explosive bestseller that got these these um, seeds going in the RPG community. The cool thing about um, this game in particular is this. Um, oh, let me flip through here. You notice that it's not, like the previous books had, uh, it was completely filled with the, the, the um, script-like text. Here we've got the section at the bottom for footnotes. Uh, and there are lots and lots and lots of footnotes. And basically any word that's bolded here appears at the bottom with an explanation of what's going on there. So basically someone says, uh, I'm going to make a fumble. You know, I, I rolled a fumble. Fumble, ding. Fumble is when you da 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 da. Uh, so other replays, like the the Ryutama replay and the the Sword Robe replay, are you got the game, you have the rules in front of you, or you know you have played it before and you just want to read something fun. So you don't have to be really coached on what's going on here. Um, so you just read it as a as a as if it was a screenplay. You get the images like like a television in your head. This one adds another. Uh, a pedagogical step where they actually whether it's a game rule or whether it's someone talking about some subculture thing that if you don't know ninja stuff or if you don't if you haven't watched this uh you know some guy will make a reference to a samurai movie he saw that you know maybe two people at the table recognize and make a little laugh at but the other people don't it'll it'll explain that joke down here um that is an incredible thing um, and it, you know, someone uses their ability, like some sort of combat ability for the first time, ding, it appears at the bottom saying what the, what the ability is and what it does, uh, and how it's used. Or sometimes the GM will say something and it'll, their words will be bold and you're like, what's that mean? They look down and the GM's like, you know, it might be a GM note, like saying like, uh, GM was off, obviously waffling here between choice A and choice B, they went with choice B. So, um, you get a little bit more of a sense of what's under the hood at the table. Uh, and again, that they explain everything from rules to uh, side jokes and chatter. In fact, someone, uh, someone in this book uh, towards the end uh, says, "Why don't you go for what?" Uh, here it is. In fact, I just turned the page by random. Why don't you go for what? You know, uh, go to work for White Wolf, uh, the White Wolf, the uh, you know U.S. RPG company. Basically, because someone said, you know, you're allowed to do a lot of self narration in the game, and someone's like, "My Ninja Clan." is from this, you know, we, we created the pyramids and we did, we all the major forces of civilization are, you know, done by our clan. And someone's also like, yeah, that's like the White Wolf thing. Like every, you know, mage gets introduced and, and you know, all the mages were responsible for all these, you know, the civilization vampires tells you the vampires were introduced, Rasputin's tied in everywhere. Um, so they're cracking a joke on that. But of course, you know, people in Japan might not have played those games. So it just kind of, you know, gave you that. Um, so that's what replays are. Um, it is not someone recapping their session. It's someone presenting exactly what happened at the table uh, for you to visualize. I mean, the, the lines are there. They might be edited to remove one or two, you know, 
dick jokes, but but the rest of the heart is there, including some side chatter. Um, uh, LOLs appear. Sighs. Ugh. I rolled a crit. I rolled a fumble. Those the, the uh, roll. You know the a, a um, onomatopoeia for roll, 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 rolling dice. Roll, roll, seven. Roll, roll, roll twelve. Uh, those appear as well. Um, so you see what it looks like uh, uh, if you if you've never encountered RPGs before, and some of the people who picked up these books never have. You have an understanding of what RPGs are. If you do know RPGs and never play that game, you have an understanding of how this game is different. If you uh, like a particular game and you say, oh, this, I love this, this is my favorite game, and you find out that the designer for that game appears in another replay, you might go like, oh, what is that person, how do they play? Like, what, 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 what kind of characters do they play? I wanna check that out. There's that sort of thing. But ultimately, uh, it gives you a blueprint, a guide of what an ideal, or at least what a session looks like where everyone has their A game. And some of these are, you know, quote unquote professionals, um, but still, uh, you know, amateur, in other words, like people like us, um, people put together really good replays because again, everyone's got their A game on, uh, they're, 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 you know, a lot of them have an interdiction with comedy. It's not like it's all serious, but I mean, they, they, they put more effort into it, of course, right? So that's basically what replays are. Um, when I encounter them way back in late 90s, early 2000s, uh, late 90s, uh, one of my best friends at the time, he, uh, he, a Japanese guy, he got me into, like, I was already into, like, uh, he, we went, uh, because uh, I was, I went to a rave and I was wearing a cyber, the cyberpunk RPG hat, like, there was, like, a really cool hat that, that uh, I got at Gen Con before I went to Japan uh, from the Art Tesla Learn booth, that it was, like, cyberpunk, but it was in the font of cyberpunk RPG, and he recognized that because he was a Japanese player of the cyberpunk RPG, and, oh, um, so we became fast friends, and uh, he showed me all this cool stuff, and basically said, like, oh, these are replays, and I looked through them, like, what the fuck, why would anyone want to read a transcript of someone else's fun? Uh, and he shot back at me. He's like, why would anyone want to read scenarios? These empty dungeons where, like, there's just a bunch of crap. And, like, you know, that's something I can come up with. And I was like, not touche. Uh, you know, some people are really good at coming up with scenarios or just, you know, plotting along. I'm going to make a room here. I'm making a room there. Um, and then once I, once I got past that initial reaction, I started looking at them, especially how they serve as a teaching tool, and especially learning how many people just randomly came across one in a library, in a used bookstore, in their, in their um, backwater town of 400 farmers that has a local bookstore. The local bookstore accidentally ordered one uh, when they ordered something else, and they put it on the shelf anyway, and some kid comes up and picks up a book. I know people who have actually got into the hobby like that. Um, it just blew my mind, especially as a side hobby where people can actually create them and, and, and publish them. So that's that's kind of a cool thing. Um, so the uh, there was a question about re uh, print replays. Uh, in fact, Brendan's uh, original question was, hey, is there anyone, uh, is there a translation out there? Uh, unfortunately, no. There's only two replays, full replays, and I mean like full, like start to finish, character generation, everything that I know of. One was actually linked in that thread, Golden Sky Stories, um, the uh, uh, Broken Window, check that one out. Uh, the other one is in Shinobi Gami. Um, the, uh, it's not, you know, what's it called, it's not published yet, it's, it's you can pre-order it. If you do the pre-order, you can actually see the entire uh, replay. It's, it's, it's its own file, you can read through it, oh, it's completely translated. Uh, those are the only two. Um, the made RPG has replays, but the thing is they don't include the whole uh, character creation part. It just basically begins with the start of the session and then ends with the end of the session. It's not as, it's not as uh, contained, it's not its own thing um, as, uh, as the, the Golden Sky Stories Broken Window or the Shinobi Gami intro one is. I'm hoping uh, in, in doing this video and, and uh, presenting Shinobi Gami and, and getting people interested in the Golden Sky Stories 1 too is to show it as a form, an art form, a teaching form that is viable in the English culture. Um, it's not going to have the same, you know, it's not going to have that whole, you know, you can publish it and put it on a book and someone's going to encounter it. That, that's not going to happen. But it can serve as a uh, teaching mechanic, especially to games with really strange themes or bizarre new mechanics that are hard to get used to. Seeing people use them at the table calmly, confidently, and then even having like maybe like footnotes that say, um, uh, what, um, 
you know, what the GM is thinking, what the player was thinking when they did those things. Yeah. So um, if anything else, even the games that I do that don't uh, have re original replays, I'm planning on doing replays for them. So uh, one last thing is this. Uh, the reason they're kind of important is this. Check out, um, well, they, they, they uh, how do I introduce this? Okay, I'll just say check out. If you go on YouTube, um, they're actually more popular on the Japanese YouTube. It's like World Star Hip Hop of Japan. Uh, it's called Nico Nico Doga, N I C O N I C O. But uh, some of them are moved over to YouTube, not as many viewers, but uh, but there's some appear on YouTube. If you go to YouTube and type in English TRPG, that's the important part, T, tabletop, TRPG space replay, replay in English, R E P L A Y. Uh, hit enter, um, you'll see a bunch of Japanese replay. Um, in Japanese, I think some of them translate to English in there. Uh, yeah, someone someone hit the someone hit the tran machine translate this entire thing and, and walked away from it. Uh, but um, but you can see how they're they're done these days. Um, in the U.S., we see people on Twitch do sessions where they got like five heads on a screen and everyone's talking and you can see each other live. Uh, in Japan, people are a little bit too self conscious for that sort of self promotion. Uh, it's happening a little more these days, and in fact, um, it's actually being popularized by some um, voice actresses and actors and things like that that are getting together to play these narrative games, really letting their voices out, and um, and those are finding a niche, uh, not an, even a niche audience, those are finding a real audience, uh, both on Nico Nico and YouTube. Um, but uh, the format that caused another revolution is about nine to ten years ago, is the format you'll see if you do that Google search on YouTube, uh, which is um, someone, instead of writing that that screenplay of text in a book, someone hacks a dating sim engine. So they have a picture on top and the words on the bottom, and they have the text of the players at the bottom, uh, you know, the in-character text. When they say a line, the, the text appears at the bottom, and they have like these little cute, super deformed figures that, that will like jump around and and, and move, and, and you know, this character will start hopping when they say a line. This character will start hopping, and the GM will say a line, and things like that. Um, and the text is done by Vocaloids. So it's pr it's pretty interesting. It's it's really weird and kind of alien. But here's the thing: uh, Call of Cthulhu in Japan was just as it was in the U.S. You know. A game that everyone had experienced or even played at some point, uh, if you're in, if you're way into the hobby, and I mean way into the hobby, but it's it's never been a top seller. It's always been like you know number you know six to twelve or six to twenty in the in a top seller list. Whatever you know, there's the new hotness and 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 Call of Cthulhu has always been a steady seller, but always in like the top ten. Uh, and there's something that's been happening that even the the chaos and people are like, what the fuck is going on in Japan? Um, basically, in the lat in in you know, 10 years ago, Dungeons and Dragons, Sword World, uh, Al Shard, another game, kind of like similar to a fantasy game, were always like, who's who's number one? Who's the biggest seller this year? Um, Call of Cthulhu just went boom and has been the single top selling RPG, period, for the last seven or eight years. Like other games, it's 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 actually the 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 scale is so grand. That it is basically like D and D versus all the other non D and D games in the U S or other countries. Uh, it is Call of Cthulhu and then everything else. And that again just happened. That that change happened in the last eight years. The reason is those Vocaloid dating sim hack replays. Um, someone's on a train. They're watching some sort of video. This thing pops up in the, hey, you might be interested in this thing. They click on it, you know, like a high school kid going to school or someone, you know. Um, and they see, like, first of all, like, what the hell is this? And the other thing is, the other cool thing about this is some of the more popular people who do these replays interject a lot of comedy into their Call of Cthulhu. Like, someone who's, like, super serious about Call of Cthulhu would kind of roll their eyes because there's, there's, like, it usually tends out to be, like, one-third comedy in these, in these things uh, or at least one-third co comedic side chatter. Um, so it's not super serious, but it is fun and fun to watch. Um, and that got an entire new generation of junior high school kids, high school kids, college kids into RPGs, period. Like that would be their first introduction to RPGs. They go to a game store, ask for Call of Cthulhu, get a copy, go home and run it with friends. Uh, if you go to a, uh, I went to, um, Game Market, which is the, 
uh, indie board game um, or J Japan centered board game and uh, RPG convention uh, that's focused on more on independent games, but but um, you know big sellers are there too. Um, traditionally has been for RPGs, more board games now recently, but uh, a lot of people come and bring their home, uh, their replays, their scenarios, their 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 fan made games and things like that. Um, now there is a line of tables at that event, which is nothing but um, this group put together a book of Call of Cthulhu scenarios. This group put a book together Call of Cthulhu scenarios, and so on and so on. Scenarios or replays, uh, scenario replay, scenario replay. A lot of women designers um, are getting into this as well. Uh, a lot, like the Call of Cthulhu scenarios, take a lot of balance and skill and detective work and things like that. That and and a lot of um, what I, I, what I'm getting the sense of, and, and from hearing feedback from others, a lot of people who are trying to break into writing, um, a lot of uh, women writers uh, in particular are using that as a way to hone their craft. So there's like there's like a line of like 20, 30 tables where everyone's doing like call of Cthulhu scenarios and replays, um, with new designers who are haven't been, um, you know, brought up on the Dungeons and Dragons and games like that. Uh, it's really kind of cool to see. So that's an interesting thing that's happening. Um, video replays are, you know, uh, there are some companies and, and stu studios that are attempting to do more like live, like sort of in, like Twitch TV style. Here's a group of people actually playing it live. But a lot of people get really self-conscious. Again, the people who are making the most of it are, are say, you sound like uh, voice actresses and actors um, and are using it half as a tool to generate interest for their fan base, half of it is to self-promote. Whatever, not bad. Um, other people are more self-conscious about that, so um, they they do the video uh, ones with the Vocaloids. Uh, and there's you know even even groups that do specific like this group that does Call of Cthulhu ones. They're really popular. They've got a lot of subscribers and hits. Uh, so there's even that sort of thing going on in the background too. Uh, and another cool thing is uh, some of some of these companies like uh, that one I mentioned, the Amadeus one. Um, this one came out and they actually commissioned a, if I recall correctly, they commissioned a, a really well done um, replay, uh, a video replay. Now, again, it was, uh, you know, some money went into it. Uh, and it, there's an interesting thing like that because like money went into it and it's well produced. But at the same time, they, they specifically said, uh, you know, this, this was sponsored by us. So um, the interesting thing is if, for example, a company, uh, there was apparently one or two instances where a company tried to recruit one of these studios to like one of these fan studios right to do one of their typical replays but for you know for our game uh do it really well etc and it really kind of like it it, it, it kind of came out like you can kind of tell that it was you know sponsored uh and it left like there, there's a lot of bad feedback for that sort of thing you're like oh you're trying to pull one over on us etc etc um it, it's kind of gooey like a marketing goo uh, all over you um but if they come, if they come out and do it straight, like they say, like, hey, no, we, we, this is our, you know, this is an official replay. We did it here, and we just want to show how it works. That we're not trying to fool you or whatever. Um, they, they've had some some moderate success as well. Um, anyway, so that's a lot about replays. Not everything, but I think that's enough that will probably satisfy you. Hopefully, this almost forty-five minutes of talking, Jesus Christ. Anyway, that's how much I know and how passionate I am about these, especially as a teaching tool. Uh, unfortunately, if uh, my day job wasn't where it was, I would have had probably about two or three of these done and I could just be like, oh, well, hey, I'll show you one of my replays, blah, 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 for some other game. I do not, uh, unfortunately. Uh, the closest I have is, again, the, the uh, if you pre-order Shinobigami, you get to see the, uh, the, the fully translated um, replay from that one uh, i am doing i'm in the middle of doing one right now i've got to like i just have to transcribe it <laughs> just have to transcribe it i just have to do all the work on it um uh, for another game that i published earlier uh again as sort of a teaching tool um uh, people understand the game people know the game I, I don't know if they'll get any interest if they know the game in, in reading it but for people who are new to the game again a very quick read about a one hour read in a format that isn't just straight rules and you have all the uh, a, a, a mental visual picture of exactly what goes on at the table. So hopefully that helps.